Welcome to Lyft360's Portland Unwrapped. And this is our first, we're so excited. We're going to hear from many leaders in our community about Portland and about our history and about our local Portland and about global Portland. We, we have so much richness to, to share. And I, I know I've been here 30 years and I continue to learn every single day um, living in the city. And so I'm looking forward to learning more um, as the day goes on. This is going to be informal. We want it to be interactive. We want you to share your knowledge and ask questions of our presenters. So please make this participatory because it'll be more fun for all of us. Um, at Lit360, we focus on leadership every day for individuals, in organizations, and throughout our communities. It's our mission to inspire leadership, build stronger leaders, and to equip those leaders to tackle critical issues that we face in Maine. That focus takes us into communities and boardrooms, teaching all sectors and all areas of the state. We deliver programs and services working side by side with organizational and community leaders. The impact of our work and the stories that we hear from those we collaborate with is an incredible reward. It is our way to make Maine an even better place to live and work. Today, we thank our sponsors for supporting this new program. A special shout out to our friends at Community Television Network. They are recording the program today. Thanks to Diversified Communications, to Machias Savings Bank, New Height Group, Pierce Atwood, Ethos and Vaunt for the design work and to Port Printing for the posters. Our champion sponsors are Unum and L.L. Bean. I also want to thank Pam Plum and Jill Dusan for being our moderators today. To Jane LaFleur, Sean Hansen, Eric Moberg and their, for their setup help today and our planning team, Carol Walker Ayton from Lift360, Bethany Campbell from United Way Greater Portland, Julie Chase of the Southern Maine Community College, Troy Moon from City of Portland, Dinah Minot from Creative Portland, Pam Plum, Jill Porter, U.S. Export Assistance Center, Amy Senstra from Portland Press Herald, and Gretchen Williams from Lift360. So I will now turn it over to our moderators. Welcome, we're delighted that you're here. Um, and uh, we're gonna learn a lot today. You are gonna share a lot of your thoughts and your information today. I think it's gonna be great. Uh, let me just ask a quick question. How many of you have come from somewhere else? Meaning you didn't grow up here. Okay, well. All the more reason to spend a little moment delving in into the history and the background of this community uh, and seeing a little bit about where the community as a whole came from. Um, we're going to be talking about the threads that make up this community, some historical threads, some modern threads, the history of the old buildings, why Portland was founded, what are its roots anyway, why did those first 40 people come here anyway, uh, what goes on, and where might it be headed in the future. Um, today, we hope to illuminate some of those questions, spark your interest in where Portland has been and where it might be going, and draw you into be a part of shaping that future. Do you want to say anything else? I just want to say hello. I actually want to check the acoustics in this building, so... Uh... Oh, what a beautiful morning. <laughs> I can promise you, you would not want me to try that. Um, okay, our first um, segment today um, <clears throat> is really about the history and the background. And we want to delve a little into where this all came from. What is the waterfront? We're here on the waterfront. We're here in the Customs House building. The Customs House building, I'm going to need to turn for help from you. Would you come and tell us how much money was flowing through this building right after it was built? Thank you. 
My name is Jeff Porter. I'm with the U.S. Commercial Service. I'm one of the federal employees that actually have offices in this building. This building is still a working federal office. Um, there were 30, I just shy of 30 of us who work here. So every place you see a door, there is, an, a, there is somebody working here or on the road. So it is still operational. Just briefly, this building is the, or was, the U.S. Customs House. It's one of 11 left in the United States. The rest of the U.S. Customs Houses uh, have either been turned over to the private sector, like in Boston, which has been turned into a Marriott, or they've been turned into, the smaller ones have been turned over to historical societies. So this is one that actually still operates, and one of the reasons that uh, myself and another individual that work here have opened this place up is we want to make sure that if um, a bureaucrat in Washington ever decides someday that this building needs to disappear, that there'll be enough of you in this community that'll rise up and make sure that that doesn't happen. So this building, the, the primary purpose of this building was to collect money. It cost about a half million dollars, $485,000 um, to build this building. It was built between 1867 and 1871. It was operational in 1872. Um, there was a, I have some articles up in my office that I'm happy to show you on the tour that talk about, the, they had 400 people here for the party. This is before, actually Portland was. Portland would have been dry at that time, so I'm not sure why they were consuming alcohol, but they were consuming alcohol in this building. Um, so this building, when it, when it opened up, Portland was either the fourth or fifth, fifth busiest port in the nation. So you were you're bringing in just shy of a million dollars a year, which roughly translates to about $200 million today. Um, again, there were, this is the only way that the federal government, for the most part, was able to collect any revenue. There was no federal income tax until 1913, when the 16th Amendment was finally ratified that allowed the federal government to tax income. So every good, or, uh, sir, every good coming into the United States would come through a customs house. So the first federal agency was customs. The second federal agency, can you guess what the second federal agency would be? Excuse me? Smart man. And why did we need a Coast Guard? We needed a Coast Guard because people cheated on their taxes back then. So every single ships would come into harbors and they would try to sneak into harbors and not pay the duties and tariffs on their goods. So what, what they were supposed to do, um, and then there were people here to make sure that they did, as they came into this harbor, or in Lubeck or the other places we had customs um, offices, the customs officials would, would go down, board the ship, they would fill out a manifest, they'd come in here, and then they'd pay their duty or tariff. Um, I will show you on the tour, we have a two-story vault, so where all of that money was kept. Um, I'm not sure why they have a second story to that vault, but they do. Uh, we don't have the ladder anymore, so that, that is on my to-do list of things that I want to do, is to go into that second story. Um, the other reason I believe, if, 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 as you travel around the country, or around the world, you should always go to a customs house. And in most places in the world, I just got back from St. Petersburg, it is the most gorgeous building you will ever find. Again, that's where all the money was. So you go into those buildings, they're just absolutely amazing. The architecture, the amount of money that was put into this building. There are little things that you just can't believe. And, and again, on the tour, we'll, we'll show you some of those um, places as well. Um, we will not bring you to the dungeon. We do have a dungeon as part of this building as well, which is actually underneath the sidewalk into the road uh, on the 4th Street side. So if you want to come back in the summer, we can show you the dungeon. Trust me, it's not a place you want to visit. Um, but the other reason these buildings are so nice is that they were designed to, it was a great lie, it was a great bluff. The United States was showing its power and wealth, of which we had neither. In most of them, if you go, you know, you'll still see some of the photos of the, the existing customs houses that exist throughout the country, and you go into the inside of them in Philadelphia or in New York, we just lost that one, that was, that's Portland, Oregon, or New Bedford. They're just absolutely gorgeous. But it was to designed to convince those people who were coming from around the world, and they went back to their countries to say how powerful and how strong our country was. And again, that was a bald-faced lie. It took us another 50, 60 years for us to get there. But I'm happy to answer questions um, later in the day. Um, I know you have a full agenda, so if I can answer questions, find me. I will be hiding upstairs in my office. My duty is to uh, introduce the speakers um, for the panel, and we have uh, 
And Jeff just provided us with the kickoff presentation um, for the speakers, uh, giving us a quick history of the Customs House. Joining on the, the panel presentation will be uh, Bill Needleman, who is our waterfront coordinator for the city of Portland. Bill's here. Thank you. Yes, right here. And then uh, Tuck O'Brien. Thank you, Tuck. Uh, Tuck O'Brien is our city planning director. Um, and uh, so you'll find in Bill, his job is straddling these two worlds, uh, straddling uh, the land and the ocean, and being a major uh, planning and uh, organizing force uh, for the city in putting that interaction together. Um, and Tuck is the uh, city planning director, and uh, you will have seen him most recently uh, leading a, a whole slew of community conversations about the new comprehensive plan that the city has been working on and is uh, putting out for discussion. I really appreciate the opportunity to come here and talk about Portland's waterfront. Uh, I've been um, when uh, Dynamon at Hubley uh, kind of pigeonholed me back a few months ago and said, you're going to talk at Lyft 360, and I said, I don't know what that is. And she says, well, it's just going to be a great conversation about the city of Portland and what's important to us, and, you know, we want to talk about the waterfront. And I said, super, and I can, you know, I imagine bringing out my, uh, my typical PowerPoint, which shows a lot of development and a lot of change. And she goes, oh, we really want to talk about what's behind that. You know, where's, where have we been? Why are we proud of our community as a waterfront community? And so I am going to start off where many of us Portlanders started off in this conversation, which is third grade. Uh, anybody who grew up in the city of Portland, went to Portland Public Schools, or has had a kid in the Portland Public Schools, know that third grade is when you learn Portland history. And um, back when I was at Roosevelt School on Stevens Avenue, they trotted us out to the Tate House as one of the first steps, because the Tate House, as that wonderful house museum in Stroudwater, was the home of George Tate, the the mast agent. And we all learned about how important forest products were. We didn't call them forest products, but we all learned about how important the masts were to the British Navy and how important Maine was as the source of those masts. But as I got older, I never really figured out why the Tate House was still there and still important because by 1755, when the Tate House was constructed, uh, they'd been cutting trees in that area of town and this area of the state for well over 100 years. Uh, the trees probably weren't right there in Stroudwater anymore. The mast trees were up in the forests in the hinterland. The mast agent was still on the Four River because it was the Four River. It was the harbor. It was the navel of this place. It's where we were born. And it was the ability to take a commodity and to move it to the world that gave Portland its identity. Um, one of the other elements, important elements of the third grade curriculum in the Portland history is the Cumberland and Oxford Canal. Um, back in the 1830s, there was a canal building craze across the country and Maine was swept up into it like many other parts of the country uh, because canals had proven themselves to be a valuable way to connect the hinterland to ports. And the very terminus of the Cumberland and Oxford Canal was right about where the Casco Bay Bridge is now, bringing forest products and agricultural products from the western part of the state down through the Sebago River watershed to the Four River and then out into the world market. Um, it was quickly taken over by rail. The Cumberland and Oxford Canal didn't operate for very many decades and it worked in conjunction with early rail development. But rail from the south coming up into the western waterfront rail to the north and west, coming to the eastern waterfront, and what connected them? Why did they come here? They came to the Four River, 
and they came to the Four River because we were a great launching spot to get off into England. We're closer than Boston. Um, it's deep, relatively deep. It's sheltered by the Casco Bay Islands, and it had all the ingredients of a great harbor. And when we had rail to the south, the plans for rail to the north in Montreal, it was Commercial Street that brought them together. And that Commercial Street is what we now define as that place where when you know you're on the waterfront when, you're on Commercial Street. And at that point, and I love this, that we're doing this in this building because Commercial Street replaced 4th Street as the waterfront drive for Portland Harbor. We're now literally right between the 1830s and the days of the, Oxford Canal, the Cumberland and Oxford Canal and the 1850s when Commercial Street was filled in to provide access not only to the harbor but to the national rail system. And we have become that place that connects the United States and the North American national transportation system to the world. Maine and our, in our economy and the national economy come together at this place. And it's been happening since the 18, well, back in the days of George Tate and the, the mast agents in the Four River. And I believe that the result of bringing these things together on Portland's waterfront are, you know, it's commerce, it's prosperity, and it's our identity, our identity as a port community. And much of the development and much of the controversy that has ensued probably over the last 30 years, um, back in the 1980s when condominium development was taking hold in this waterfront, um, there was the, the rally and cry that we need to preserve our working waterfront because we're losing our identity. We were also losing commerce. And while we love waterfront condominiums, anybody who's been in one, it's, they're, they're lovely. But what we lost in the 1980s, or we saw uh, slipping away, was the actual commerce that took place on the piers that those condominiums replaced. Today, we are seeing a lot more waterfront development. And it's happening on both ends of the spectrum, where we can see development on the, or potential development on the western waterfront reconnecting us with that heritage of being a global port. And other developments that spark that thought of preserving the working waterfront, more hotel, and the ideas of gentrification on our waterfront that worry folks about the preservation of both our heritage and our identity, but also the commerce that takes place, the commerce that needs trucks and needs forklifts and needs bait, the things that potentially conflict with restaurants, hotels, and a tourism-related economy. I think they can come together on our eastern waterfront where we see that the cruise ship industry has really sparked um, a resurgence in the idea of passenger transportation on our waterfront. While cruise ships may be tourism, they also employ longshoremen, chandleries, stevedores, the <clears throat> types of industries that handle ships really appreciate the fact that we're getting a lot more ship visits here in the eastern waterfront. And the city is also working on the eastern waterfront to encourage that active participation between our citizens and the water through the development of open space and uh, the, our work with the Amethyst lot and transforming a portion of our eastern waterfront into a public place where we use the water, where sail training and uh, public landing and just the general passive enjoyment of being on the water can all come together in a place that looks right out into the harbor, right out at Fort Gorgeous. So thanks for a little rambling tour. Um, I kind of lost the thread there towards the end. 
but I want everybody to kind of walk away with this pride that we as a community for many years, through many transitions, through the transition from road to canal to rail to highway, and now maybe back again and revisiting some of those modes, um, we've stayed connected to our waterfront and our waterfront remains the identity of this city uh, as a poor community. Thank you. Hello. Uh, did the canal run through Canal Plaza? Or if you could just speak to that a little bit. <laughs> Thanks so much. A name question. So, um, pardon the pun, but I may be a little out of my depth with regard to this. But the uh, Canal Plaza was the, um, uh, the 1970s home of the Canal Bank. And the Canal Bank was formed for the financing of the canal itself. Um, Bill and Tuck, thanks for being here. And, uh, and Tuck, I'm not sure what you're going to cover, so I'm going to toss out three themes, and if one or other of you are going to cover them, that's great. Uh, one is um, rising water levels and um, what the plan for Portland is on that. Uh, two is um, business with uh, the Maritimes of Canada. Um, and how we envision that perhaps being um, built in both in transportation, business, whatever. Um, and three, bear with me. Oh, I, I got it. Um, risk to our waters in this area. There's been a lot of conversation about are the lobster moving out. And I know that's a whole coastal issue. And I'm only using lobster as an example. But when I think working waterfront, do we need to be concerned about our fishing industry? And what is the impact on ensuring we keep our core resources in this area? Thanks. Wait, um, three huge questions. Uh, you yeah, those are, those those? are uh, three you know, full week conferences in each one. Uh, so very, very briefly on sea level rise, uh, we know that sea level rise is happening in Portland Harbor because we have a tide gauge on Main State Pier that has been tracking uh, a steady increase in sea levels for over 90 years. Uh, the question is, uh, what's that rate of acceleration? Um, and so what will we do on our Portland waterfront? It's an excellent question. We don't have a specific answer, um, but the general answer is that we will adapt. And we are undertaking a planning exercise in the Bayside neighborhood called Bayside Adapts uh, to understand how to um, transform urban infrastructure and business opportunities and development opportunities in a condition of more water. And what we learn in Bayside, um, and we're taking Bayside on first because when you're standing at the sidewalk by Whole Foods where the notorious flooding happens, you're actually about five feet lower in elevation than when you're standing on the deck of Main State Pier. Uh, Bayside is our more vulnerable neighborhood. And what we learn in Bayside, we will use elsewhere in the city, including Commercial Street. Um, but I use the anecdote of, uh, that Charlie Poole tells on Union Wharf when they did some sewer work a while back and were excavating a parking lot, and they dug, th dug down three feet, and they found parking lot. <laughs> uh, we'll have to bring some sediment to the party. Uh, with regards to maritime uh, commerce with the Maritimes of Canada, um, fortunately the Aimskip uh, service of the Icelandic steamships company that is now uh, going to the western waterfront at the International Marine Terminal, um, Starb does have stops in the Maritimes, and uh, there is opportunities uh, for direct service between Portland and Halifax as well, though that's more on a, on a speculative. But we actually have those connections right now through Aimskip at the IMT uh, into the Canadian Maritimes and then on to uh, both Greenland, Iceland, and Northern Europe. Um, and the last one was... Uh, climate change and lobsters and uh, uh, threats to our ocean, uh, ocean warming, ocean acidification, uh, the buildup of nutrients in our bay, um, all are legitimate and serious threats. And fortunately, we have great partners with folks like the Friends of Casco Bay, Casco Bay Estuary Partnership, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, who are all staring this in the face and doing extremely important work. Do we have an answer for any of those things right now? Um, no, 
will we continue to question, work, and strive to make sure that we have both a, an ecologically <coughs> solid foundation within our bay, but also a commercial resource that we can continue to utilize, like our fisheries. Um, uh, we need these places because we, we're going to run out of calories, and uh, the ocean is how we are going to feed ourselves, and so working with the aquaculture industries, uh, the fisheries, fisheries management, and the scientists around these many and myriad threats um, is going to be uh, our ongoing um, task uh, as, as participants in a poor community. Bill, could you um, perhaps elaborate a bit about the um, issues of the fisheries and change in the past and potential change in the future, uh, which perhaps today is more driven by uh, environmental changes than commercial changes, but the history of the fishing industry and the future of it. Or, or the marine resource industry, to be sort of stated more broadly. So I think this is a great example of how when you start to talk about waterfronts, you quickly can get into very large issues. Um, so the, you know, marine commerce, fisheries commerce, you know, historically and into the future, again, it could be um, a week-long seminar. Um, I think one of the interesting anecdotes is that the first significant pier built to support fisheries in the city of Portland was built in the 1980s. Uh, we were not a, we were a fishing town, but we were a port community. Um, fisheries expanded greatly in the 1980s and 1990s due to federal subsidies, um, you know, a fairly lax look at figure, fisheries regulation and uh, changes in technologies that allowed us to catch fish really efficiently. Um, and the, the stocks just tumbled. And <laughs> What we learned from that is that it is not an infinite resource, that the resource changes over time due to human influences, due to natural influences, and our science and our management structures, um, I think, are always in a process of playing catch up, and that we have to be nimble. We have to know that no one fishery is going to stay stable because the environment is not stable and our influences on the environment are not stable. So as a community, we need to be nimble and we need to be able to react to changes that are beyond our control. So that means having uh, diversified fisheries, it means having a diversified maritime economy generally so that when one particular issue like lobster's booming right now, we're at historic high landings for lobsters statewide, relatively stable down here. If lobster fishery takes a big hit, shell disease, migration of the species, um, we need to be prepared to backfill that. Likely that backfilling will take place in the form of aquaculture, but there may be new species that come in uh, and fill that void. Fundamental, clean water. And if we have clean water, we have the opportunity to at least let this environment respond and bring in the kind of life forms that we may want to eat and sell. I just wanted to expound on what Bill was saying. My primary job here at the commercial service is to help companies export their products and services. I think some of you may have glossed over the article that was in the Press Herald this weekend talking about the lobster industry. The Canadians have signed a free trade agreement with Europe. That's, that is going to jeopardize upwards of $140 million worth of business for Maine. Not only is the Canadian dollar 25% cheaper um, with this trade agreement, which should go into effect probably by May, maybe as late as June, um, the tariff rates, all the way, uh, 8% on lobster, disappear for the Canadians. That 8% tariff rate is still going to be for our clients. So I think one of your speakers later is Kurt Brown um, from Ready Seafood. He can address that, but I can assure you that, um, that is the most immediate concern that the seafood companies feel right now. And it's not just on the lobster industry, it's other sectors, but the lobster industry will definitely see the largest hit. Thank you, Tuck and Bill, for coming <clears throat> and for your efforts in both increasing the traffic to the waterfront and preserving the identity. My questions are about traffic management. Uh, so you've talked about on the eastern waterfront 
the uh, increase, you know, we've got thousands of units of condominiums, hotels. Uh, there's now a proposal from the Economic Development Department to sell the open space land uh, that is currently around where the VA is and um, I'm not exactly sure what the streets are abutting it, but basically all of that open parking lot that's down below 4th Street in the Portland Company, there's now a proposal from your department to sell that to turn into apartments, hotel, um, mixed use. And we've got the thousands more units that are, that are coming online there. And then on the western waterfront, uh, the, new, the new comprehensive plan calls for that to become more of a trucking hub. And there's the proposal for the 75-foot cold storage facility. So these are both great opportunities for the city for a lot of traffic and development on the waterfront. My question is, how are you managing the land-based traffic and you know, the increase in the 18-wheelers, for instance, on Commercial Street, and then the thousands and thousands of car trips that we're going to be generating on the east end? Thank you. So it's a great question, and I think one of the things that Portland has right now is a lot of opportunity. Um, we have something that a lot of American cities don't have, which is transportation capacity. Um, we're engaged in a study of our parking needs downtown, um, and we are beginning uh, to do a lot better job, more sophisticated job, of looking at making sure that we examine our transportation grid holistically and leverage all of these opportunities to make sure that as our transportation network becomes more um, robust and becomes more uh, full of users, that we are getting the maximum community benefit possible. So how we're doing that is uh, with modeling, how we're doing that is with bringing in um, additional resources to look at a development not only of uh, the metro public transit service in the city, but also starting to once again look at what technology and innovation can do. Um, transit management associations, uh, private shuttles, um, allocation of parking, demand management, those kind of techniques that re rely on more technology that wasn't available. Um, as cities grow, uh, they become more congested. Uh, that's, that's the way that growth works in terms of we are in a, an area, in a world where people are still using their cars. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is a cost of our growth. Um, I, I will say from our standpoint in both, we work very closely with economic development. Um, the disposition of the, the Thames Street parcel, which is the dirt parking lot that you're referring to on the corner of Thames and Hancock, um, is both going to intro introduce more traffic, but also is one of the signature parcels uh, that the city owns that is available for redevelopment, and probably one of the signature parcels for commercial development in the state of Maine. Um, you mentioned the 58 4th Street uh, development, bringing online upwards of 600 additional units of residential. We have the growth um, in the cruise ship industry, which, which hit 100,000 passengers this year, as well as uh, potential opportunities to increase um, development on the western waterfront, all of which is going to bring more traffic, all of which is going to bring more demands on our parking. Um, we are learning, though, as we do better quantification, um, and, and this comes as a surprise to a lot of people, uh, that there is capacity. We have significant capacity both in our transportation infrastructure and our parking infrastructure. What we have to do a better job of is managing that and leveraging it to get the most community benefit that we can. So as we go forward, I think the answers to your question are, uh, are going to be partially technology, and they're going to be partially taking a more holistic view of understanding that a development at the corner of Thames and Hancock is going to have an impact at Washington in 295 and making sure we understand those connections. So that was a great segue because the next segment is Tuck's presentation and um, our goal, the meeting plan is very flexible. Uh, so Pam and I are going to go with the flow, but our hope here is that uh, Tuck has a few minutes to present. And then uh, we'll have more Q&A, and then we'll uh, maybe turn to uh, the <clears throat> notes that are on your name tags about the two or three things that you noted in response to the question on the, on the registration form. So Tuck, take it away. Thank you, Councilor Dusen. Um, so I, I'm going to try to be quick so we can get back to, to questions because I think that, that was really interesting conversations. Um, I, just to start out a little bit, my, my history 
my background is very different than Bill's. I, I've lived here for seven years. Um, my, I have a second grader at Longfellow who still hasn't got to that class that Bill could teach. Um, and I love being on panels or in meetings with Bill because every time it's just such a fascinating story of how our community got to where we are today. Um, I'm going to talk a lot more about what happens next and where we're going and how we're trying to achieve fundamentally a balance. You know, Portland started like the residential of this community was moving things on the water and moving things out of our port. Um, now that's a part, and we want to make sure that, maintain, that stays a part of what our community does. But there is so much else going on here. A lot of it's interrelated and a lot of it isn't. Um, our tourist economy wouldn't be as robust if it wasn't for the waterfront. Um, we hope that as our breweries grow, as our local agricultural scene grows, that we are able to harness uh, our port to export. We hope that we are able to develop, because of our geographic location and our waterfront location, a better connection to Northern Europe that puts us at a comparative advantage to other, other places. And all of this is, you know, the traffic piece is such a key component of this because all of this requires balance and effective management. And I, I, so I'm going to take four themes, um, talk briefly about our comprehensive plan and our general approach to adapting our city's regulatory structure to the future. But four of the th things that Bill said that I think are really applicable across what we're trying to do as a city are flexibility. Um, the flexibility is really important to preserve waterfront, um, working waterfront land as the, as the ebb and flows, excuse the pun, of the working waterfront come. We wanted to preserve land. We were, had set aside land for ground fishing. The ground fishing industry had, it, had a moment and then kind of receded into the background. But re preserving that land for the next maritime use is going to be really important. Um, that leads to the second theme, which is adaptation. How do, we, how, how do we position ourselves to take advantage of our opportunities uh, and not forestall what might be coming in the future? Um, a big theme of our comprehensive plan and our ability to stay ahead of things and be ready for innovation has to do with quantification. One of the things we are really pushing with this comprehensive plan is better data, better use of data. It goes to transportation, it goes to land use planning, uh, it goes to economic impacts. Uh, we are really pushing for uh, some out outcomes of our comprehensive plan to be the robustness of our data sources. Um, and lastly is what we're doing today, what we're going to do tomorrow night for the comprehensive plan public hearing, uh, what we've been trying to do all along, which is conversation. Uh, it's a discussion of all of the interests. Uh, a, a lot of these choices involve um, compromise and, um, and looking at different options. Um, we, we are not ever given silver bullets. We're never given the one no-brainer, 100% fail-safe choice. Uh, there's always competing needs, and I, I think uh, Councilor Dusan could talk to this more than anyone about uh, on a weekly basis, she's, she's sitting in a situation where she is wrestling with very passionate arguments that are very well-founded in, in, in passion about our community um, and trying to weigh those. Um, and, and that needs to keep going on, and it needs to keep, you know, we'll finish the comprehensive plan, which has been a a really successful community conversation. But that document only works if it doesn't sit on a shelf, if we're constantly using it to continue the conversation. Um, so briefly on the comprehensive plan, um, it's been about an 18-month process. Uh, it's involved over 2,400 um, Portland residents and business owners, uh, eight community forums. Uh, we've worked with three public schools, uh, Portland High, Casco Bay, and King Middle. Um, one of the things we realized is that this plan really belongs to the freshmen in high school, in our schools. When this plan kind of comes time to do the other plan, those, those kids are going to be in their early to mid-20s. And they are going to be the, the people that we want to still be able to live here and raise their families um, and to have established roots and have opportunity in our, in our city. Um, we've had six planning board workshops and we'll start the hearing uh, tomorrow night. Um, this comprehensive plan represented a shift for the city. The previous plan served mostly as a compilation of a lot of the other efforts that had gone on, and it was very successful in that. But some of them were competing, uh, and over time, it lost the central narrative about, you know, at a 30,000-foot level, what the goals of the city were. Um, 
So we tried to st step back and fundamentally establish what we call a community value statement, um, what Portland is. And, and that was based on the uh, starting place of a survey that we did that was very successful and had over 2,000 respondents. Uh, we tried to distill what we heard from people and unpack a lot of what we had, we, we had heard related to people's core concerns or um, goals for our community. Uh, and we, we basically ended up with a, a value statement or a community vision that has six key themes. Portland is equitable. It is sustainable, it is dynamic, it is authentic, it is connected, and it is secure. Big, broad themes. Um, but it's important to have that kind of vision to judge all future policy decisions off of and to look at our policy choices and goals and say, does that really balance across all of those themes? From that, we have uh, eight different subject areas, um, waterfront, economy, housing, um, environment, parks, open space, future land use, um, that try to take go from 30,000 feet to 15,000 feet and develop some implementation strategies that look to move forward the community vision. Um, we're hoping that this comprehensive plan starts as a guide for growth, something that gets used uh, on a yearly uh, basis by the council and its goal setting that is constantly available to the planning board that new businesses looking to come into our community look at. But it, it's trying to stop at a 10,000 foot level, uh, establish a broad vision and lay the framework, uh, but no more than the framework for the ongoing work that we're going to need to do. Um, and one of the pieces of the ongoing work that's going to happen is an examination of our 892 page uh, regu land use regulatory framework uh, and looking at um, what we can do um, to better match that document with the goals of our community. Um, and I'm happy to get into specifics on any one area, but that will be driven by best practices nationally, this community conversation, a constant feedback loop. Um, one of the things we had done in the past was it's, it's a lot of effort um, to get zoning changes through the city council. And so we would make a zoning change and it would, there would be certain things that would need to get fixed, but that wouldn't happen because of the effort it took to um, start that process. And, Starting with the India Street form-based code, which we've revisited four times since its initial adoption, we've looked to make zoning more iterative, um, to allow that feedback loop, to allow course corrections, to allow new data to influence um, what we're doing, and we hope to make that um, a more consistent practice. Um, so I, I think with that I can stop and we can get back to, to a conversation. Um, I just have a question, sort of going back to traffic and transportation. Um, as we see more and more increasing traffic, particularly cruise ship traffic, and lots of tourists who are not particularly willing or able to walk great distances, um, there used to be the 8A bus that ran just the peninsula loop. It didn't go all the way out to Hannaford. It was very practical for tourists. Mm -hmm. um, is there any idea, any thought of bringing that back in the future, either just on cruise ship days or potentially in the future um, all the time? because we do have a lot, I work at Victoria Mansion, and we get so many calls from people down on the waterfront who just aren't willing to walk that distance. Yes. Um, we, that, that, is, that is so on point. So, um, and if Greg Jordan, who's the, the head of the Metro, was here, he would say we are constantly looking to refine the route, um, routes to get at all those different audiences. Uh, it's hard to figure out with the current structure of how the bus system works, those kind of targeted special routes for brief periods of time. Um, we have seen innovation about, like, such as moving all this, the school kids onto the buses have been really successful. So there's gonna be three factors that are gonna need to take place. One is going to be flexible vehicles and thinking at the metro, which is already taking place. Second is use of technology. So not necessarily Uber or Lyft, but there are other companies, private companies such as Bridge, that are, are doing this with the private sector that we're looking at bringing to Portland. And the third is, is public-private partnerships such as transit management associations. Um, one of the things that I am really passionate about right now is looking at uh, a TMA shuttle loop um, going from the transportation center at Thompson's Point along the waterfront um, past 58 4th Street in hitting some of our major institutions such as Maine Med and USM. Because at different times of the year, 
all of those uses are having an in intensity and the ability to share parking between them and to share transportation between them. For example, on cruise ship days, parking becomes really a premium down here, but school tends to not be in session, so facilities out there, but there's nowhere to get in between them conveniently. So that's something that we're starting to look at. I'd like to follow up, and the, uh, the private sector has really done a good job trying to fill that void and uh, we've had, and, and we're trying to work with them to provide minimal infrastructure that promotes the use of private tours to uh, get our tourist visitors around, especially on cruise ship days. And so we've uh, created a waterfront marketplace down in uh, the Commercial Street, Thames Street area, and we expect to, the, to try to concentrate some of the, the tour, bus, and trolley activity down in there to clean up the streets a little bit, um, make it more predictable predictable for the, the visitors um, and to get them to more places around the city. And I would encourage institutions and destinations to, um, you know, to reach out to those folks as well to put together good packages for folks that create an, an attractive visit for them. Well, mine just turned into twofold because of her question, which is, could you speak to biking, bicycling here in the city? Because a lot of people may not be able to walk a certain distance, but so many cities have adopted grab a bike. Mm -hmm. And if our, from that 30,000 or even 15,000 foot view, I think we could have some connections, um, you know, much better, safer uh, ways to get around with your bike. Right now, in some areas of our city, you take your life in your hands. And that I, as a driver, I'm always afraid when I see a biker in certain areas. So that, I'd, if you could speak to that in my original thought, I'd like you to speak to when you were giving us the six points. Could you speak to secure? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Sure. Um, I especially feel in these uncertain times when I hear that word, I want to know what's keeping us secure. Thank you. So with regards to bikes, uh, we have had a, uh, a first year with a bike rental down on the eastern waterfront. Uh, so for those folks who are visiting and would like to access the city by bike, they have that opportunity. Um, and just uh, received a, a, a very interesting presentation at the Sustainability and Transportation Committee last night, um, uh, where uh, Councillor Dusan sits. Uh, uh, from a, a, a extremely energetic, competent, and um, uh, you know, I'd say inspiring young woman looking to bring bike share to the city, and there's a, what appears to be a, a credible movement in that direction, and we hope to see uh, progress in that regard. Uh, the interesting takeaway that I had from her presentation last night was that often the infrastructure that creates the safe environment follows participation. The more bikes, the better the infrastructure. And so the, the better, the more bikes we have, the more likely we are to invest in and create the safe environment that expands that opportunity. Um, quickly on bikes, because I, I think that, the, that, that hits the nail on the head. I think a couple things that need to happen. Um, when we do the survey, uh, people are overwhelmingly in favor of uh, recreational recreational bicycle amenities and also commuter bicycle amenities. But when we're actually having the conversations um, about budgeting and this, the CIP, those voices tend to not be as, as prevalent. Um, and so that's part of it. Um, I think the other thing is just the recognition that uh, there needs to be innovation because in a northern city, uh, it's, it's a challenge to keep our bicycle infrastructure uh, intact and in place with all of the abuse that our roads take uh, during our winters. Um, it's, there, are million, there, are not million, there are many, many places around the world with equally or more severe climates that do that. It's just a challenge. Um, and we just need to rise to that challenge. And, and lastly, it's working on the people who are working with, talking to that conversation with the people who don't bike um, and who commute into our city to work or you know, and are always going to use that car, which is fine. Um, if, if, you know, I, the, what I always tell people who kind of are, you know, roll their eyes when we talk about bicycles, I say, you know, you don't need to bike. But 
if 10% of, of your neighbors in the community who, who would like to bike feel safer doing it, that's 10% of the people who aren't driving. Uh, and that's great for everybody. Um, so on that, and so on secure, so we originally had five, um, five elements that we distilled from the survey. And then we went out to the community and the, the bottom circle, um, it's a Venn diagram. I, I should have brought the, the easel, but um, the bottom circle was a question mark, and it was Portland. Like, what are we missing? What else is there? Um, and what we heard from a number of different communities, uh, we met with the South Sudanese uh, Community Association, Homeless Voices for Justice, a bunch of neighborhood associations, um, was this issue of security. And it wasn't, part of it was physical safety, um, issues about crime, but it was more about housing security, job security, and security of your place in the community. Um, and it's very intentional that at the top and the bottom of our Venn diagram are equitable and secure. And that secure is not only about uh, community policing and the work that our police department does, but also gets at a lot of the work that Councilor Dusan has been doing with the housing committee to make sure people have, have places to live. And that people who are here that are part of our community recognize that the rest of us have their backs. Um, and we own that. That is what our community believes in. That's what we heard from our community about our value statement, that whatever else is going on in the world, Portland has strong beliefs that are distinct from those and that we shouldn't be afraid about saying that. I was curious if you could tell me what your plan is for directional signage in the community. I can see that you're working on uh, Franklin Arterial, but the fonts and the icons are a bit small and hard to read from a few cars back. Um, but the rest of the city has some old signage, not really great signage, so for those visitors that are coming into town, they're kind of going blind. Um, so that was one question. And I don't know if you want to bring up something from Bill's presentation, but I was curious if you could tell me or elaborate with the importance of the Americold facility and why it's so vitally important to keep our working waterfront thriving. So one of the things, the wayfinding in the city, we've worked on it a lot. We've done a lot of studies, and Casey could uh, talk about this at length as well. Uh, the parking study is once again reaffirming that part of the major problem with is, and it's a New England thing, I, I grew up in Boston and it is like prides itself on being hard to get around, but part of the issue is, is we've never got the branding and navigation right. People who are trying to find parking for the museum who aren't from here, people who are trying to get around, if you just step back yourselves, even if you know where you're going, and try to see the visual cues to find your way around, too small, faded, inconsistent, um, not helpful. Um, and so uh, Bill actually uh, has, has done a lot of work on this and more will be coming to kind of, this is one of the city manager's priorities. Um, uh, it's a lot cheaper to get some effective signs made than to build a parking garage. Um, so with regards to the Franklin Street project, that's actually a pilot of a citywide uh, wayfinding uh, study, uh, implementing a portion of a, a citywide wayfinding study that was done a few years ago. Uh, and with the, uh, you know, which ended up with hundreds of signs spread out throughout the peninsula at all of the highway interfaces, the surface road interfaces with the peninsula, and it ended up with a pretty staggering price tag. Uh, so we started off taking the graphic conventions and some of the um, concepts of that study and applying them to Franklin Street because people couldn't find the ferry. And they couldn't figure out, well, which ferry? You know, there's Island Ferry and there's International Ferry and there's Cruise Ship. Uh, and then what we've learned is that people don't really like them. So it was actually really good that we didn't spend that huge nut right off the beginning uh, because we probably need to work with the graphic conventions. Um, I think the Franklin Street pilot project has some successes. Um, it certainly um, doesn't hit on all cylinders and uh, with the prioritization from the manager's office and support from council and especially support from the community um, and um, likely bringing money to the table, because this stuff is incredibly expensive, um, that's what would get it done. 
I'm going to go in a little different direction. Um, so you had talked about the, um, the high school students uh, wanting them to, to be here. Uh, Maine has an aging population. Um, I also see the uh, fisheries and the tourism to be a little bit cyclical and um, vulnerable to disruption, disruptors. Um, so what are we doing from a planning perspective to bring in um, technology or, or other uh, maybe more steady um, business segments? That's an awesome question. So the first section is, uh, the first answer is, 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 you know, we worked a lot with the high school students, but that wasn't the exclusion. One of the other big components of the comprehensive plan was to provide a framework and, and, and a better integration of aging in place and to provide a community where people can, you know, have uh, sustainable hospitals where they can be born, where they can have great schools where they want to stay and they want to, people want to raise their kids, where there are jobs when they get out, uh, and where they can retire and move to smaller places and have choice. So whether the choice is, um, you know, we've, we've seen actually a lot of um, senior living type of, of housing come online lately. So we're kind of getting more robust in that segment. Um, I think the family housing area is where we really need to do a lot of work. In terms of the economy, you're 100% right. Uh, diversification is going to be the key. Uh, we tried to uh, spend some time working with the, both the startup community and the mid-size um, mid companies to make sure that we put into the comprehensive plan language that reflected what they were trying to do. Uh, we also tried to not forget the focus on two specific segments. One is local ag and value-added uh, local resources. So that, that's always going to be a big part, whether it's going to be uh, ocean-related is, is cyclical. You're right. But there's probably going to be something else going on, you know, whether it's going to be kombucha or the next thing we haven't thought of. Uh, to that point, one of the things we've tried to do is when the tasting room um, boom happened, we were caught flat-footed. Our regulatory structure really didn't anticipate it and it became very challenging. Um, so we tried to step back. Uh, Bill talked about looking more at pilot projects and being more flexible with temporary uses uh, so that we can't predict what the market's going to do. There's brilliant people out there trying to figure that out. We just want to be ready when they have those ideas. I think that's the best thing that as the government we can do. Um, trying to set up an environment where we attract a couple more 500 person companies wouldn't hurt, but um, I would like to make a point about the cyclical nature of uh, the fisheries industry. Uh, that can be largely modified by, well, at least uh, mitigated by two factors. One is broadening our scope for supply. Um, how do we uh, bring in marine resources for processing here? And that's one of the things that happens through Aimskip. Um, and uh, at the western waterfront that uh, those areas of the North Atlantic with rich fisheries are now supplying our processors on the Portland waterfront with material for, um, uh, for uh, filleting, packaging, freezing, shipping into the national market. That's happening now and has the opportunity to expand. And there was a question of why is the western waterfront so important? Um, it's critical to our employment base on the waterfront that we have access to quality, world-class quality seafood from elsewhere because, we, because it is cyclical here at home. And the other opportunities are in aquaculture. Uh, a way, you know, we, we, we do need to transition from being largely hunter-gatherers in the, on the ocean uh, to farmers. Uh, we're about you know, six or 7,000 years behind uh, in, a, in a lot of these aspects. Um, we're gonna need those calories and there's going to be a hungry world ready to eat them. And we want to have a place here in the Portland waterfront uh, using the resources of Casco Bay and the coast of Maine to grow them. The piers, wharves, and industrial areas in the city of Portland to process them and a port to ship them. It's a good story and it's real. And it does help modify against the swings of um, what's happening out in the ocean. So, my name is Peter Neal. I'm from the World Ocean Observatory. I'm, I'm very much a newbie. I spent 20 years in New York advocating for the working waterfront, so I have a sense of deja vu here. Um, and and I, I see a couple of things to observe. One is that um, 
truth is in the details, and planners and, and c citizens become consumed by the details, and that's a necessary thing, and flexibility is a, a, very, a very important aspect of that. Um, there's also a lot of lip service to the working waterfront. When time comes to it, uh, actually people don't mean it. It's a romantic notion that doesn't translate necessarily into, the, into a more narrow uh, set of, of values. Um, the details notwithstanding, truth also is sort of in a cosmic idea, and port is a cosmic idea. Port is a place of, of exchange of goods and people and ideas. So maritime ports, uh, import and export, uh, transport, trucks and trains, uh, uh, airports, cyber ports. So that the fact is that a, a, a small regional city with access to quality of life, perfectly placed on the Atlantic Ocean, outside of the eastern megalopolis, is a tremendous idea in the making. And it, it, when I despair is when I hear catch up and I hear uh, reaction to, because that's planning by looking over your shoulder backwards. Whereas planning is supposed to be a prospective exercise. And what, what the comprehensive plan is doing in those values is very progressive and, 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 and interesting, but it doesn't necessarily affirm the big idea. So Port City has tremendous implications for what this city can become, not what it is, what it was, but what it can become. And the ocean is an enormous opportunity. It's not just, I'm Skip, it's, it's not just a one-way trade. It's not just um, uh, train cars. It's intellectual property that's going to be going back and forth. And those are that, that industry, and it is industry, uh, is looking always for a place uh, outside of those other inhibiting places. So I keep hoping that I hear somebody say, look, we're going to contextualize the future of this city as a place of exchange of goods, people, and ideas, and all the details would follow. But it becomes a kind of driving principle, a driving idea, a driving concept for who we want to be. And I guarantee you that ocean industry, ocean employment, ocean productivity, ocean sustainability has enormous applications in, in terms of job opportunities, tax base, tourism, new people and families coming in, different kinds of, of demographic shifts. All of that will occur if you can essentially arrange the ideas around the, 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 the prospect of a future identity. Uh, so I love what I'm hearing because I think it's possible here. New York actually under Bloomberg changed because he understood what a big idea is and he sort of began, allowed the city to adapt and even invent. But Portland has, like Maine, the advantage of scale. That's the greatest strength of this place, I think, is that you have talent and you have scale, which means in, in terms of the ability to actually implement and take advantage of opportunity, it, it, it could work. But it can only work if it's focused and prospective. Okay. Beautifully said, and, and one thing that I would like to layer into that is geography and, and the, the, the specific place in which we live and how the, um, you know, and I started off with the history because I think that we've retained this incredible um, man-made or human-made geographic feature of piers and wharves in a 19th century form based along a waterfront drive adjacent to our downtown that puts the framework where that kind of environment can evolve. Um, we do need to nurture it and take care of it, and um, I really appreciate those comments. Uh, thank you for those great remarks, Mr. Neal. Um, and that's one of the things I think our city always needs is bold vision, so it's great to hear your voice. Something occurred to me when somebody asked, or, uh, my name's Lisa Whited, I also sit on the planning board. Um, somebody mentioned parking earlier and, and adding people to our city. And I was reflecting back, 1988, for a couple of years, I commuted to Boston and uh, two days a week and would park on Newbury Street without a problem. And then now, you know, in, over time, as I would go back, I'm like, hmm, it's harder and harder to find a spot. Now I don't even try. 
And so I was thinking about as we think about our own behavior and expectations, things change. And um, the other thing I was thinking about is in the 70s, we had 10,000 more people than we do today. So the capacity, I'm really glad you talked about the capacity, Tuck, and then we have the capacity, and sometimes it's just changing our expectations and behavior around uh, how things have changed. And that requires people to be open-minded and realize the value of progress, but also the inclusive conversation that you're having and supporting to make positive change. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Paul Drynan. I'm the executive director of Friends of Fort Gorgeous. And I've had the pleasure of working with Bill, but I haven't met you yet, Tuck. I want to just backtrack and uh, touch back on a couple of points you made when you talked about the big vision for the city and the 30,000 foot view. I heard you mention the word connectivity. Did you mention commerce or economy? I'm assuming that's in there. Yeah, so here, here's, the, here's kind of the bold vision of, of the, the community value statement is the economy is interspersed in all of those values. Housing is interspersed in all of those values. The waterfront is interspersed in all of those values. So when you ask what Portland's economy is, it should meet those six value statements, which is why the economy has a separate section, but in and of itself is not part of the community value statement. Okay, great. As those things relate to the overall vision, I also heard the word data, and I'm wondering if the comprehensive plan uh, allows for any conversation as the use of Fort Gorgeous pertains to all of these things, economic impact, job opportunities, tourism, working waterfront, et cetera. Thanks. Yeah, it does. I think if you look at the open space recreation section, the historic resources section, uh, the waterfront and the economy section, all could kind of be applied to what we're trying to accomplish in Fort Gorgeous. Um, you know, part of authenticity is our, our history, our shared history, and our historic resources section kind of takes a threefold approach. Um, identification of our historic resources and making sure there are people out there kind of doing the work on Fort Gorges. Uh, education. Um, I think a lot of people don't in their day-to-day -day experience how rich our culture is and why it's related to our history. And then the third piece is, is preservation. Um, and then on the open space side, Connecting the chain is one of the key components of both the future land use plan and um, the open space plan. And Fort Gorges is a piece of the chain that's, that's not really connected right now. And, and, and actually bringing that back into the web uh, is really important. Uh, thank you very much.